Hi everyone, Alicia from Migraine Australia here. You know that as well as being a Migraine Australia ambassador and volunteer, I'm also an ambassador for VEDA, the Vestibular Disorders Association. I live with vestibular migraine and it can be really tough to manage. Dr. Ron Granite is a neurologist in Sydney who's done some research into vestibular migraine treatments and joins us today to chat about the options. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Granite. Pleasure. So as you know, vestibular migraine in the community is not well known and not well diagnosed. So today we're gonna to talk about some key questions that a lot of the migraine community have. So just wanna kick off with what's, what are some of the key differences between VM and migraine with dizziness and vertigo attacks? The key thing I think to understand with, with vestibular migraine and migraine in general is um, whether, whether there's an external uh, stimulus or, or an internal problem. And, and in migraine in general, it's an issue of perception. So um, as, as you know, and, and I'm sure a lot of the people watching know, migraine is associated with a lot of sensitivity to external stimuli. So lights are perceived as brighter and, and painful and unpleasant and sounds perceived as louder and more painful and unpleasant as well. And the, the best way that I sort of see and explain it to my patients is the, the inner ear inputs, the vestibular inputs from migraine are also amplified in vestibular migraine in particular. So what you feel, and, and there is experimental studies to show this, what you feel is a larger degree of inner ear input than your body would otherwise have. So studies have shown, for example, that, that normal patients uh, without vestibular migraine will perceive head movements of a certain degree as similar to what they were. But with eyes shut, vestibular migraine patients will feel the same thing, just much bigger. So you can see it as, as an amplification of what normally happens. And it's sort of the same sort of oversensitivity of migraine patients to inner ear inputs as migraine patients have to other inputs. And everyone has different sort of degree, some patients with migraine have, you know, a lot of photophobia, so very, very sensitive to light input, whereas other patients tend to have more noise and other patients tend to have more the smells with the nausea that goes with it and things like that. Mm -hmm. So in that regard, I think uh, it, it's appropriate to see it as just a selection of different things that you as a migraine patient are more sensitive to or otherwise. Whereas, you know, other, other versions of dizziness, I guess we, we can talk about as well, other versions of dizziness are more malfunction of the inner ear apparatus as such. So, for example, benign positional vertigo is yeah. uh, an increased stimulus because of loose crystals in the inner ear, an increased stimulus um, from the inner ear to the brain. Um, motion sickness is, is an increased stimulus because the head is moving in the car. But we know that motion sickness is amplified in migraine patients and a lot of patients with migraine, and there are studies to show that as well, um, improve after immigrant treatment for their motion sickness. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a combination of you as a migraine patient are more sensitized to the inner ear inputs. And then sometimes those are increased by other conditions as well. So um, I think it's good to sort of see those as, as two, two different things, but they're, they're very much interrelated. So you touched on um, obviously the other conditions that you can have as part of a vestibular condition or just from having migraine there. So um, in terms of the, the BPPV or Meniere's disease, there's also the triple mm. AD. What are the differences between VM and those other conditions or how do they co-coagulate together? Like, can you explain those to us? So, I mean, benign position vertigo is a very common disorder. Lots of people mm. have it have it and and it's it's just very common in the community and i've certainly had lots of my patients with vestibular migraine have bppv episodes as well it's simply mm -hmm. loose crystals in the inner ear that normally sit on top of hair cells and that's how our body normally understands where it is in space because the crystals literally hold on to the hair cells mm -hmm. and bend with gravity but when they fall off into the canal they can then trigger um, the inner ear at times when it shouldn't be triggered and in a way it shouldn't be triggered Mm -hmm. So that, for example, will increase, will increase uh, the stimulus from one ear and make you feel like you're spinning. Whereas vestibular migraine is going to be more, I feel whatever I feel amplified. So whatever mm -hmm. stimulus is actually there is amplified and the two can definitely coexist. Many ears disease is another disease where the inner ear malfunctions. We're not quite sure how that works, but we know that it's probably an increased pressure in the inner ear causing stimulation of those hair cells again. And again, it gives you an abnormal input 
an abnormal sensation of, of movement from that inner ear. If you combine that with vestibular migraine, you'll simply get that even stronger. Mm -hmm. But they're, they're two separate conditions, though I have to say that a lot of the symptoms often overlap. And it's mm -hmm. often, I've had patients where you think they have both, but you do all the end testing, it ends up all being vestibular migraine. It's interesting, um, isn't it? Because I know a lot of people that already have vestibular migraine, they also have the diagnosis of triple PD as well. And a lot of the symptoms are very, very much the same. And you're right, they do cross over. How would you go um, about getting a diagnosis if you thought that you had VM or you thought you had triple PD or any one of those vestibular conditions? So I think the, 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 the answer is it can be trickier than what it looks like. Um, the, the studies show that even tests of inner ear function, where we squirt water into the inner mm -hmm. ear and see exactly how the, the brain responds to those in terms of inner ear function, can be abnormal in a small percentage, in, in not an insignificant percentage of vestibular mm -hmm. migraine patients. So I think it's tricky. Um, but you should at least have a very good history to make sure that, that the sim where, where the symptoms sort of lead you as well, in terms of ear symptoms and other migraine symptoms as well. Uh, imaging the inner ear uh, on MRI to make sure there's nothing mm -hmm. else going on is important as well. And then inner ear function studies are also useful. That's where I mentioned the squirting water in the ear, which are calorics, and there are a whole bunch of other electrical tests of inner ear function. And more controversially, there can also be electrocochleography, which is getting the electrical uh, impedance. So essentially the electrical characteristics of the inner ear that can help clarify whether it's a stronger version, it's a more clear version of many years disease, or if it's just by exclusion with the other symptoms, vestibular migraine. So would they come to a neurologist? So someone with those symptoms, would they come to a neurologist first or would they go to an ENT first? Because I think there's a bit of confusion between the both. Can you talk us through that? I don't think, I don't think there's a, the perfect answer. Mm -hmm. Certainly, Neurologists who are comfortable with vestibular disorders should be able to organize all those tests and go through it mm -hmm. um, and, and rule out most of the things that, that would need to be done. And certainly neurologists would be the right ones to then follow it up with more medical treatment of a, a migraine disorder as well. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, having things too strictly defined, it's got to be this or it's got to be that, uh, may mean that, that people miss out on, on something that, that is important to exclude. So often, you see both um, and, and a, a good ENT will say, it's not a structural inner ear problem, continue with the neurologist side of it. So I don't think there's a right way and a wrong way to go about it. Um, you just need all those things done and, and gone through properly. And even just, even just excluding a structural inner ear problem with which an ENT can do can be very reassuring. And that too can be a useful thing to do. So I don't think you can say, oh, well, this is the right doctor, that's the wrong doctor. We all, in, in, in the end, play a, a useful role together and even reassurance and a negative can be a very positive thing. So the specific neurologists that we would need to see if we thought we had any of those vestibular conditions or are we able to just see any neurologist? <sighs> it's interesting. I think Raphael was asking similar sort of questions <laughs> before. What's, a, what's the difference with a migraine specialist neurologist? I think the answer is, is what, what the neurologist is comfortable with and what the neurologist often deals with. So mm -hmm. I deal with a lot of these patients, so I'm comfortable with it and I have no issue sort of mm -hmm. going through it because I've done it hundreds and thousands of times. Um, it, it depends, I think, is the answer. And some neurologists okay. are more specialised in other things, but they may see enough of these patients to, to make it, uh, to, to be able to treat them appropriately anyway. So I wouldn't be able to say, oh, it's got to be this way or that way. It's what people are interested sure. in. Sure. Why do you think um, getting a diagnosis for vestibular migraine is so complicated? I, I think the answer is not that hard in the sense that it's a diagnosis of exclusion. There are now diagnostic criteria, and the problem is that there weren't before. Mm -hmm. And I think a, a lot of the time when people were training, it didn't exist. So there was no such thing as vestibular migraine. So when you're saying... Uh, can't you be diagnosed with it? You can't be diagnosed with something that, that didn't exist as such. Um, it certainly now does exist in the medical literature. It's accepted. But I think, therefore, some, some would be more accepting of it than others and some believe it more than others. And, you know, I certainly know from colleagues, some tend to diagnose different things where I would diagnose vestibular migraine. Mm -hmm. I think at the end of the day, 
the way to think about it would be it's important to rule out the serious and the structural and then it's a matter of trying to come up with solutions that fix the problem. So I've had patients who were treated for anxiety and, and other symptoms, and they improved, and yet their symptoms persisted, which kind of says, particularly in them, it's not just anxiety. So I think it's important to take an overall view, and, and sometimes we can't be 100% accurate because there's no diagnostic test. There's no blood test I can say, when your level is above this, you have this diagnosis. So sometimes it's a matter of trial and error. And in so doing, you see what works and what doesn't work, what helps, what doesn't help, and you move on from there. Thank you. Why do you think um, a lot of the symptoms are tied down to anxiety? Just asking from a personal perspective as well, that when we come with these symptoms, we have no idea what's going on. We know within ourselves that there isn't something quite right. And it often does get swiped off as being anxiety. Is there, is there a reason for that in the medical field? I, I I think I don't think that the data is in there enough for me to say that is yeah. fully evidence back. From, from my perspective, it's an awful thing to have. You mm. feel terrible. Mm -hmm. You're you're suffering uh, and often unable to do things. In other words, you're disabled. Mm -hmm. and that's very anxiety provoking. We know in chronic migraine, for example, yeah. which has a lot more literature to it, that depression and anxiety are much more common. And the more patients have that, the worse. Um, their symptoms are as well. So it's a self-fulfilling, it's not that it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, but it's, it's a, it's a self-driving sort of feedback loop. Mm. And when you're feeling terrible, you feel anxious about when's the next exacerbation coming. You're then worried about that. And that anxiety will then drive whatever symptoms you have as more, uh, more unpleasant, um, which means that you'll get more anxious about the next mm. one, which means that the symptoms are more unpleasant and away we go. So to me, it's important to realize that regardless of whether you, you call things anxiety, vestibular migraine, or whatever you call it, often there are lots of overlapping features uh -huh. and there may be overlapping aspects to it. So you treat all those bits and pieces simultaneously or sequentially, depending on how, how you and the patient want. Um, and uh, at that point, you then uh, see what improves and, and move on from there. What are the so, so I certainly think anxiety is a, a huge component of it that shouldn't be ignored, but equally I wouldn't say, oh, that's, that is the one thing it is and nothing else. Okay, so you're saying that there's definitely an interlink, which I truly believe there is because having a vestibular condition myself, yes, it does make you very anxious in the beginning, hmm. but it's not the reason why we you know, have this anxiety or why we don't. Um, and I think often it does just get kind of discarded as though, it's anxiety or it's this, and we often don't get a diagnosis to be able to mm. firm up how we're feeling in that moment and get the treatment that we need. Is there any treatment methods that you can talk about with the migraine community for someone who would have VM? What, where would you start? I think, I think as I said, there, there are, the answer is yes, there's a lot, a lot of different treatments that you can do and you have to tailor it to the, to the individual as well. So um, to split it up broadly, there are lifestyle measures. So, so I'll, I'll take a step back, actually. I, I don't think the treatment for vestibular migraine is particularly different from mm -hmm. migraine in general. Um, and so uh, all, all the trials, and there are a few, show that all the drugs that work for migraine work for vestibular migraine. So I don't think it's a, it's a different entity. As I said in the beginning, I think it's part of a spectrum of the bits that you're most sensitive to, but it's still part of the same disease. So all the same medications are there and should work. Um, why I say should is because we've got less data to, to say, yep, it definitely does. Mm -hmm. And then I think it's important to split it up, as I said, into, into a, a different categories, including lifestyle and psychological uh, treatments and then uh, medical treatments. And then on the side, I'll put vestibular, vestibular therapy and, and physiotherapy type things as well. Um, to address that briefly, I think it's important to rule out you don't have VPPV. And if you do to treat it, and mm -hmm. that I think at least can be done fairly uh, easily and effectively with the particle repositioning maneuvers. And sometimes it's unclear and you just have to do it again and check. Um, apart from that, um, the evidence for sort of motion habituation and, and those sorts of exercises mm -hmm. is variable. Some studies say it seems to work, others don't. And in a survey I did, um, trying to think now, probably about four years ago, a mm -hmm. lot of patients had tried it, but a, a, a large proportion of those found no benefit 
And I think the answer is that probably the ones who found benefit from it would have had something like benign positional vertigo and those who didn't probably just had straight migraine. Um, when you are excessively sensitive to motion mm -hmm. and you then do a lot of movement, you're actually gonna trigger things more rather than right. less. So I yeah. wouldn't be surprised that some people got worse yes. because you're just driving a system that's already really upregulated. So really sensitive and tuned up. So I think it's important to, to try to, to get that back under control before you can then get used to, to movement being perceived normally again. Mm. And then in terms, of, in terms of lifestyle treatments, there are a lot of different things we can do, psychological therapy and, and, and other exercises to manage stress and anxiety, as we mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, are really important. And then there's a lot of other triggers um, uh, that drive stress, be that, you know, workload and, and work-life balance and all those things, which I think are critical to sort of think about and address. And then a whole bunch of other things from alcohol consumption and caffeine consumption mm -hmm. and sleep deprivation, which kind of ties in with, with uh, all the, the stress things and insomnia, um, which you sort of got to address all those pieces together as well, because um, if you can find the underlying cause in that regard, it may not be the explanation for why you have migraine, that's probably genetic and environmental mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. But if that's the major thing that's driving your migraine, why not address it? So I've, I've, I had patients, you know, working under extremely stressful conditions who we sort of said, look, or, 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 or with grief or all sorts of other, you know, family stressors and all of those. And we said, this is obviously the reason why a migraine got worse and we will treat the migraine. But if we address the underlying factors, it will improve regardless of whether we use medication and so on. So I think that's, that's really critical to kind of figure out what's underneath and, and you know, potentially continuing to drive it. Having said that, I've got lots of patients who uh, are well controlled, get a bit worse, but are still manageable on good therapy despite marked increase in stress. So the medications and other treatments can definitely buffer the, mm -hmm. the, the stress leading to definitely increased symptoms. So I think it's still, it's still worthwhile to treat and, and see if you can manage that. It's definitely all down at the end of that. Oh, absolutely. And you just got to address all those aspects because if you, if you deal with one and not the other, if it's so, so, you know, if you deal with medication for anxiety and say, that's that mm -hmm. you've missed out on two thirds, at least of what's going on. And, you know, you may well have some improvement, but you won't have the, the complete package of improvement that you otherwise could. And after that, there are lots and lots of drugs and the various, all, all these medications have their, their pros and cons, typical side effects and response rates. The, the, the literature basically, so that all the medical studies don't show a huge difference in an overall population between each one. So often it's a matter of selecting the right drug for the right patient, more in terms of what side effects are actually benefits for that patient and what side effects are more, more prominent and, and would be a bigger concern for each patient. And at the end of the day, it's often a matter of try one, if not try the other, try the other. And the things that I tell my patients who I see a second, third and fourth opinions is often the doses that were tried weren't enough or the, mm. the duration of time that the medications were tried for were in, inadequate. And, you know, they need to have been on full, you know, therapeutic dose for at least six to eight weeks. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that may be longer depending on how, how uh, frequent their symptoms are. Mm. Um, but we do know that in, in all the major drug trials with lots of patients in them, that a medication that shows a benefit will accumulate further benefit for at least a total of six months of therapy and sometimes longer. So longer duration therapy is, is, is necessary, um, but you, you need to give it at least a decent trial to start with to pick up, is this a medication that is beneficial for you or is it something that we have to uh, pull out of and, and move on to something else? And would you say in terms of medication for those people who have um, a vestibular condition to go slow um, before, you know, they make it to that maximum dosage? Are you supportive of that? I know there's lots of um, vestibular patients who are anxious about taking medication because they often feel like they may be fighting with those symptoms that you were talking about in terms of taking medication. Um, I think from where I sit in my perspective is the slower you go and you kind of just increase your dosage as you feel comfortable. Are you, are you supportive of that? Or how, how does that um, react in terms of having a vestibular condition? I, I think the answer is that's the same with, with every condition. 
in medicine, full stop. Mm -hmm. the, the faster you go, the more side effects you get. Mm -hmm. The slower you go, the less side effects you get. So yeah. I think, and I don't think vestibular migraine is particularly different in that regard. I think the major issue is um, how sensitive are you to the particular side effects of that particular medication? So I wouldn't also throw a blanket statement on that. I'd say, try it, see how you go. And if you tolerate it, you can build up uh, as fast or as slow as you feel comfortable. But that has to be weighed up against the, the you know, time on maximal dose. Sure. So the slower you go, if you take three months to get to a, a therapeutic mm -hmm. dose of a medication, you're then going to need to wait at least two more months mm -hmm. to see if it works. Then you're going to need to come off it and try the next one. Whereas if you could get on it in two weeks, obviously the whole process is faster. So you obviously have to tailor it to each patient. You have to tailor it to each uh, situation and each medication. So just because you couldn't tolerate one drug doesn't mean that the next drug, you also have to go super slow. Mm. I think the answer is you try it, you see how you go and, and you try and achieve a balance between getting, getting through the trials to find the right drug quicker versus not being able to tolerate the drug and therefore ending all the trials uh, too early. And, and the answer is you try it, you see how you go with the first dose. If it's too much, you work your way back slowly. And if it's fine, you move up. And I've had patients with both who said, I, I generally tolerate medication well and didn't. Mm -hmm. And I generally tolerate medication terribly and did. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't say that just because you didn't tolerate drug A means that you won't tolerate drug B. Yeah, okay. And that's a great perspective. I think it gives a lot of people hope that, you know, there's lots of different types of medications out there in terms of holistic treatments and all the rest. How do you think Absolutely. diet? Do you think diet plays um, a big part in, in that treatment circle? Diet is tricky. So the problem, the problem with diet, so I've had I've had some patients swear blind to me they ate my, my best example was I ate nothing but rice and broccoli for an entire <laughs> week and I felt a lot better. Yeah. And I said, fantastic. Can you keep going like that forever? No, no. And it's not useful. Mm. I've had other patients who've gone through um, detox diets and, and, and you know, diets that, that pick out uh, all the micronutrients in food. And I know that's a very popular thing to do. Mm. Um, go through it for years, literally two years. And they said, I'm still no better. Mm -hmm. and, and the data isn't there to say that that works. Um, and, and I find that that in some ways almost creates more anxiety because people are on the lookout for, oh, what caused this? What caused that? That food was it the strawberry I ate or, you know, was it the chocolate that I dreamt about the other night that seemed to be the trigger? Mm -hmm. often, often food, uh, I'll throw this in now, often food um, can be part of migraine, not so much a trigger but as part of the migraine process in terms of cravings. So the classic link between chocolate and migraine, for example, mm. can just as easily be a craving for chocolate prior to the onset of the migraine headache, but the migraine process, which involves a prodrome of feeling super energetic or depressed, tired, insomnia, the whole enchilada, all of those things are part of the beginning of the process of migraine, but we'll say it was the chocolate that caused it, whereas in fact, it was the migraine that caused all of it. Mm. So, you know, over vigilance and hyper anxiety about what you put through, uh, what you put in your mouth can sometimes be detrimental because it just adds to the stress and the workload of trying to manage the migraine. Mm. The, the only trials that show any vague sort of usefulness of diet over, over uh, any specific diet are one high quality diet um, works well. Mm -hmm. So the better quality your diet, the less likely you are to have worse migraines mm -hmm. and then uh, other studies which were unfortunately of poor quality um, and I'll explain that in a second where they suggest vegetarian type diets are mm -hmm. better again um, which kind of overlap with the high quality diet the problem with doing diet studies in migraine in particular and in many conditions in general is the way we do it is you, you, you use comparator groups in, in other words you try and give one group a diet and the other group, no change in their diet. The problem is when you enroll people into a study, the people on the placebo diet, in other words, no change, say, oh, maybe I should adopt some of those habits of the, the intervention group anyway. And the intervention group go, ah, this is hard work. I can't be bothered. And so in the end, the two tend to overlap a bit too much. Mm. So it's very hard to draw conclusions because both groups will get better. Is that because they're in a trial? Is that because they changed their diet? It's, it's very hard to see. Mm. Um, and, and, and that's why I think the data is not there and the data is going to be very hard to get. 
you think there are specific triggers for some people in the migraine community in terms of, you know, citrus, MSG, eating nuts and those types of things? Or do you think that they are just that migraine prodrome? I, I think it's very hard to, to tell the difference. And occasionally, so I know alcohol is a very clear trigger in a lot of my mm -hmm. patients. We stop them drinking, the migraine frequency reduces. So that's why I'd certainly say that, that moderating at least mm -hmm. alcohol is, is really important. Apart from that, it's very difficult to tease the two apart. Yeah. Um, but the answer is then if, if you are 100% convinced that that's a trigger, try and eliminate that and see what happens. And often you'll find that, that they still keep coming. And, and what you have to do is do that all with a headache diary because yeah. if you monitor it with, um, if you monitor it, oh, I feel better, I think it's working, um, it, it doesn't help. So a headache diary is really important. To, to decide if any intervention's working, be it dietary change, stress management, mm. and of course, medication. And I get all my patients to, to keep track uh, with a headache diary before and after each change and see, is there an obvious change with it? Great, we continue, we up the dose, we, we redouble our efforts, no change, turf it, don't, don't keep going because it's mm. a waste of your time. Yeah, and I think a migraine diary is so important just to keep your own records. You know how migraine is very unpredictable and likes to change it up all the time? Absolutely. Finally, um, can you tell us a little bit about the research that you conducted? You touched on that briefly, um, but I believe you did some research um, and a treatment survey that you conducted in 2018. Can you talk us through um, that, that research study that you're doing, if there's any future research that you're going to be doing? Yeah, so, so what I'll do hopefully by the time the video comes out is I'll, I'll give you a link to, to a, an updated survey that I'd love as many patients as possible mm. to go through. And what we're trying to do with that is see, are there any correlations, any predictive factors to say uh, that this particular treatment will help you particularly compared to everyone else? Because as I said before, what we know is these medications work about the same, um, but which patient benefits from which medications a really, really hard thing to figure out. And at the moment, what we do is trial and error. So um, mm -hmm. what I'd like to do is, is uh, get more and more data to see the more patients. I tried this, I tried that. These were my characteristics. These are the sorts of things I like and dislike. Uh, these are my other medical backgrounds and mm -hmm. see if we can tease out a model um, to, to predict which patient will respond to which treatment. So I'll, I'll uh, have that organized. And and what we have, uh, what, what uh, I have in the past, as I mentioned, uh, around 2018 is run that, that survey once, um, and we had about 300 respondents. And mm -hmm. the data showed that there were, uh, you know, there were lots of patients tried lots of different things, mm -hmm. but unfortunately their, their response rates were all about 50-50. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't clear um, which, which particular medications were more effective we could certainly see that a lot more people, for example, tried beta blockers and things like mm -hmm. that, um, mm -hmm. but, but it wasn't clear that any one of those was, was more effective. And so I think what, what we need in that regard is more, more data and mm -hmm. the more patients we have from further afield as well, rather than just my practice alone, for example, but mm -hmm. you know, all around Australia, around the world, will give us, will even out, you know, each doctor will have a preference to try one medication over another. Awesome. So if we even all that out and get as many different treatments as possible with enough people, we'll then hopefully be able to see, well, the response rate of this medication was better than that medication. Mm -hmm. And I do, I do have that data on my website and I, and I did uh, sort of publish that on my website uh, after the survey was done. So I'll give you the, the, the links to that as well. Yeah, please do. I think there's um, a lot of people within our Migraine Australia members group particularly and our um, Migraine Australia cohort that would love to be involved in that research study. Thank you for talking with us today. I really appreciate that. It's a pleasure. The more I think, to, to me, I think it's really important because the more, more people understand what's going on, uh, migraines grossly, as you know, mm. migraine is grossly underdiagnosed and undertreated. And I think the more information is out there for people who suffer from it and also people who they know that the better it is half half the problem i think is patients come in sort of going this is my lot in life i think that's terrible we mm. can definitely do more there's a lot of available treatment options that unfortunately you know sometimes patients when they first encounter the medical system don't get anywhere and kind of go well i'm stuck and to me, that's such a waste. There's so much more we can do. And so the, the, the more we can get that message out, the better.
I think it's definitely about finding where you can go for help, who you can ask for help, um, and whether or not you're being managed by your GP correctly, I think is um, definitely a place to start because there's lots of us out there who think that we are being managed correctly when we're not, and we essentially lose hope when there's people out there that we can see just like yourself. Absolutely. Look, I, I certainly think don't lose hope. There's there's a lot we can do, and it is getting better and better, as, as mm -hmm. uh, you know, with with more and more new treatments being available and there'll be more to come. So, so definitely don't lose hope and just work through all those things that we discussed earlier on. Um, we'll get a long way to, to getting people better. Thank you so much for chatting to us today. Absolute pleasure.